Well, here we are. It's Tuesday, December 13th, 2022. I'm Larissa, and we're going to start reading a new book today. So, decided we're going to read something funny. This is Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut. It is his seventh novel. Um, I have read nearly all of Mr. Vonnegut's, the late Mr. Vonnegut's repertoire. And I was introduced by, introduced to his work by a boy I was dating in high school, uh, Bill Hill. Bill Hill, wherever you are out there, hope you're well. Um, and that, that book was Slaughterhouse-Five. That was the first Vonnegut work that I read. And I was hooked. So, a little bit about Mr. Vonnegut. He um, was a World War II veteran, and he was a survivor of the bombing of Dresden which he talks about fairly openly um, in a lot of his work. And um, interesting, very, very interesting, interesting person. I've known a lot of World War II veterans, um, both of my grandfathers, of course. Um, I know, I knew a woman who had been a member of the French Resistance, Laura Rychek, um, and numerous other people, numerous other, other, other persons. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, like, the way people respond to war um, and to specific conflicts. And a lot of World War II veterans that I have met, they, they have gone one of two ways. Either they they cling to their, their religious faith of origin um, tightly and, and um, are extremely supportive of the Constitution, or they become atheist communists. <laughs> and that was the case with Laura Rychek. She was an atheist and a communist. Um, and it really upset my grandfather whenever he heard of people like that because he was, he was the opposite. He clung to his, his faith, his, his faith in, in Christ, and was extremely um, held reverence for the Constitution, right? Um, Mr. Vonnegut what, considered himself a humanist, and um, that is an atheist faith. And I try to wrap your mind around that. Humanism is is, is a philosophy um, that embraces atheism, and he mentions a, he's very political in his in his work, um, and and yeah, you'll see when we get in, get into this book. But this book is extremely irreverent. And Mr. Vonnegut was extremely irreverent, um, and that was part of his humor. His his work spanned um, political satire, and and science fiction, and dark humor, right? So a little twisted. He's a little twisted. He's very funny though. Very very funny. The uh, last thing I read by him was Man Without a Country, and that was excellent. You know, I, I believe it was, that was his last work before he passed away. Um, anyway. Breakfast of Champions. I started reading it yesterday to myself just because it had been so long since I'd read it. It's been a number of years. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I just need to remind myself. I'm like, oh, yes, it is still very, very funny. Like, chuckling to myself out loud. And this, this book of his does have illustrations. <laughs> Breakfast of Champions. Or... Goodbye, Blue Monday. By Kurt Vonnegut, with drawings by the author. In memory of Phoebe Hurdy, who comforted me in Indianapolis during the Great Depression. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold, Job. Breakfast of Champions. Preface. The expression Breakfast of Champions is a registered trademark of General Mills, Inc., for use on a breakfast cereal product. The use of the identical expression as the title for this book is not intended to indicate an association with or sponsorship by General Mills, nor is it intended to disparage their fine products. The person to whom this book is dedicated, Phoebe Hurdy, is no longer among the living, as they say. She was an Indianapolis widow when I met her late in the Great Depression. I was 16 or so. She was about 40. She was rich, but she had gone to work every day of her adult life, so she went on doing that. She wrote a sane and funny advice to the Lovelorn column for the Indianapolis Times, a good paper which is now defunct. 
defunct. She wrote ads for the William H. Block Company, a department store which still flourishes in a building my father designed. She wrote this ad for an end of the summer sale on straw hats. For prices like this, you can run them through your horse and put them on your roses. Phoebe Hurdy hired me to write, a co to write copy for ads about teenage clothes. I had to wear the clothes I praised. That was part of the job. And I became friends with her two sons, who were my age. I was over at their house all the time. She would talk bodily to me and her sons and to our girlfriends when we brought them around. She was funny. She was liberating. She taught us to be impolite in conversation, not only about sexual matters, but about American history and famous heroes, about the distribution of wealth, about school, about everything. I now make my living by being impolite. I am clumsy at it. I keep trying to imitate the impoliteness which was so graceful in Phoebe Hurdy. I think now that grace was easier for her than it is for me because of the mood of the Great Depression. She believed what so many Americans believed then, that the nation would be happy and just and rational when prosperity came. I never hear that word anymore, prosperity. It used to be a synonym for paradise, and Phoebe Hurdy was able to believe that the impoliteness she recommended would give shape to an American paradise. Now, her, her sort of impoliteness is fashionable, but nobody believes anymore in a new American paradise. I sure miss Phoebe Hurdy. As for the suspicion I express in this book that human beings are robots, are machines, it should be noted that people, mostly men, suffering from the last stages of syphilis, from, from uh, locomotor ataxia, were common spectacles in downtown Indianapolis and in circus crowds when I was a boy. Those people were infested with carnivorous little corkscrews, which could be seen only with a microscope. The victim's vertebrae were welded together after the corkscrews got through with the meat between. The syphilis seemed tremendously dignified, erect, eyes straight ahead. I saw one stand on a curb at the corner of the Meridian and Washington streets one time, underneath an overhanging clock, which my father designed. The intersection was known locally as the Crossroads of America. This syphilitic man was thinking hard there at the crossroads of America about how to get his legs to step off the curb and carry him across Washington Street. He shuddered gently as though he had a small motor which was idling inside. Here was his problem. His brains, where the, inst where the instructions to his legs originated, were being eaten alive by corkscrews. The wires which had to carry the instructions weren't insulated anymore or were eaten clear through. Switches along the way were welded open or shut. This man looked like an old, old man, although he may have only been 30 years old. He thought and thought, and he kicked two times like a chorus girl. He certainly looked like a machine to me when I was a boy. I tend to think of human, human beings as huge, rubbery test tubes, too, with chemical reactions seething inside. When I was a boy, I saw a lot of people with goiters. So did Dwayne Hoover, the Pontiac dealer who is the hero of this book. Those unhappy earthlings had such swollen thyroid glands that they seemed to have zucchini squash growing from their throats. All they had to do in order to have ordinary lives, it turned out, was to consume less than one millionth of an ounce of iodine every day. My own mother wrecked her brains with chemicals, which were supposed to make her sleep. When I get depressed, I take a little pill and I cheer up again, and so on. So it is a big temptation to me when I create a character for a novel to say that he is what he is because of faulty wiring or because of microscopic amounts of chemicals which he ate or failed to eat on that particular day. What do I myself think of this particular book? I feel lousy about it, but I always feel lousy about my books. My friend Knoxberger said one time that a certain cumbersome novel, quote, read as though it had been written by Phil Boyd Stooge. That's who I think I am when I write what I'm seemingly programmed to write. This book is my 50th birthday present to myself. I feel as though I am crossing the spine of a roof, having ascended one slope. I am programmed at 50 to perform childishly, to insult the Star-Spangled Banner, to scrawl pictures of a Nazi flag and an asshole and a lot of other things with a felt-tip pen. To give an idea of the maturity of my illustrations for this book, here's my picture of an asshole. I think I'm trying to clear my head of all the junk in there. The assholes, the flags, the underpants. Yes, there's a picture in this book of underpants. I'm throwing out characters from my other books, too. I'm not going to put up any more puppet shows. I think I'm trying to make my head as empty as it was when I was born onto this damaged planet 50 years ago. I suspect that this is something most white Americans and non-white Americans who imitate white Americans should do. 
The things other people have put into my head, at any rate, do not fit together nicely, are often useless and ugly, are out of proportion with one another, are out of proportion with life, as it really is outside my head. I have no culture, no hu humane harmony in my brains. I can't live without culture anymore. So this book is a, is a sidewalk strewn with junk, trash which I throw over my shoulders as I travel in time back to November 11th, 1922. I will come to a time in my backwards trip when November 11th, accidentally my birthday, was a sacred day called Armistice Day. When I was a boy and when Dwayne Hoover was a boy, all the people of all the nations which had fought in the First World War were silent during the 11th minute of the 11th hour of Armistice Day, which was the 11th day of the 11th month. It was during that minute in 1918 that millions upon millions of human beings stopped butchering one another. I have talked to old men who were on battlefields during that time. They have told me in one way or another that, that the sudden silence was the voice of God. So we still have among us some men who can remember when God spoke clearly to mankind. Armistice Day has become Veterans Day. Armistice Day was sacred. Veterans Day is not. So I will throw Veterans Day over my shoulder. Armistice Day I will keep. I don't want to throw away any sacred things. What else is sacred? Oh, Romeo and Juliet, for instance. And all music is. Phil Boyd Stooge. One. This is a tale of a meeting of two lonesome, skinny, fairly old white men on a planet which was dying fast. One of them was a science fiction writer named Kilgore Trout. He was a nobody at the time, and he supposed his life was over. He was mistaken. As a consequence of the meeting, he became one of the most beloved and respected human beings in history. The man he met was an automobile dealer, a Pontiac dealer, named Dwayne Hoover. Dwayne Hoover was on the brink of going insane. Listen, Trout and Hoover were citizens of the United States of America, a country which was called America for short. This was their national anthem, to which was pure balderdash, like so much they were expected to take seriously. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright straws through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. There was one quadrillion nations in the universe, but the nation Dwayne Hoover and Kilgore Trout belonged to was the only one with a national anthem which was gibberish sprinkled with question marks. Here's what their flag looked like. It was the law of their nation, a law no other nation on the planet had about this flag, which said this, the flag shall not be dipped to any person or thing. Flag dipping was a form of friendly and, res and respectful salute, which consisted of bringing the flag on a stick closer to the ground than raising it up again. The motto of Dwayne Hoover's and Kilgore Trout's nation was this, which meant in a language nobody spoke anymore, out of many, one, e pluribus unum. The undippable flag was a beauty, and the anthem and the vacant motto might not have mattered much if it weren't for this. A lot of citizens were so ignored and cheated and insulted that they thought they might be in the wrong country or even on the wrong planet that some terrible mistake had been made. It might have comforted them some if their anthem and their motto had mentioned fairness or brotherhood or hope or happiness had somehow welcomed them to the society and its real estate. If they studied their paper money for clues as to what their country was all about, they found, among a lot of other baroque trash, a picture of a truncated pyramid with a radiant eye on top of it like this. Not even the President of the United States knew what that was all about. It was as though the country were saying to its citizens, In nonsense is strength. A lot of the nonsense was the innocent result of playfulness on the part of the founding fathers of the nation of Dwayne Hoover and Kilgore Trout. The founders were aristocrats, they, and they wished to show off their useless education, which consisted of the study of hocus-pocus from ancient times. They were bum poets as well. But some of the nonsense was evil, since it concealed great crimes. For example, teachers of children in the United States of America wrote this date on blackboards again and again and asked the children to memorize it with pride and joy. 1492. The teachers told the children that this was when their continent was discovered by human beings. 
Actually, millions of human beings were already living full and imaginative lives on a continent in 1492. That was simply the year in which sea pirates began to cheat and rob and kill them. Here was another piece of evil nonsense which children were taught, that the sea pirates eventually created a government which became a beacon of freedom to human beings everywhere else. There were pictures and statues of this supposed imagery, imaginary beacon, for children to see. It was a sort of an ice cream cone on fire. It looked like this. Actually, the sea pirates, who had the most to do with the creation of the new government, owned human slaves. They used human beings for machinery, and even after slavery was eliminated because it was so embarrassing, they had their descendants continue to think of ordinary human beings as machines. The sea pirates were white. The people who were already on the continent when the pirates arrived were copper-colored. When slavery was introduced onto the continent, the slaves were black. Color was everything. Here's how the pirates were able to take whatever they wanted from anybody else. They had the best boats in the world, and they were meaner than anyone else, and they had gunpowder, which was a mixture of potassium nitrate, charcoal, and sulfur. They touched the seemingly listless powder with fire, and it turned violently into gas. This gas blew projectiles out of metal tubes at terrific velocities. The projectiles cut through meat and bone very easily, so the pirates could wreck the, the, right, the, the wiring or the bellows or the plumbing of a stubborn human being, even when he was far, far away. The chief weapon of the sea pirates, however, was their capacity to astonish. Nobody else could believe, until it was much too late, how heartless and greedy they were. When Dwayne Hoover and Kilgore Trout met each other, their country was by far the richest and most powerful country on the planet. It had most of the food and minerals and machinery, and it disciplined other countries by threatening to shoot big rockets at them or to drop things on them from airplanes. Most other countries didn't have doodly squat. Many of them weren't even inhabitable anymore. They had too many people and not enough space. They had sold everything that was, that was any good, and there wasn't anything to eat anymore, and still the people went on fucking all the time. Fucking was how babies were made. A lot of people on the wrecked planet were communists. They had a theory that was left of the planet, they had a theory that what was left of the planet should be shared more or less equally among all people who hadn't asked to come to a wrecked planet in the first place. Meanwhile, more babies were arriving all the time, kicking and screaming, yelling for milk. In some places, people would actually try to eat mud or, or such on gravel while babies were being born just a few feet away, and so on. Dwayne Hoover's and Kilgore Trout's country, where there was still plenty of everything, was opposed to communism, it didn't think that earthlings who had a lot should share it with others unless they really wanted to, and most of them didn't want to, so they didn't have to. Everybody in America was supposed to grab whatever he could and, and hold on to it. Some Americans were very good at grabbing and holding, were fabulously well-to-do. Others couldn't get their hands on doodly squat. Dwayne Hoover was fabulously well-to-do when he met Kilgore Trout. A man whispered those exact words to a friend one morning as Dwayne walked by. And here's how much of the planet Kilgore Trout owned in those days. Doodly squat! And Kilgore Trout and Dwayne Hoover met in Midland City, which was Dwayne's hometown, during an arts festival there in the autumn of 1972. As had already been said, Dwayne was a Pontiac dealer who was going insane. Dwayne's incipient insanity was mainly a matter of chemicals, of course. Dwayne Hoover's body was manufacturing certain chemicals, which unbalanced his mind. But Dwayne, like all novice lunatics, needed some bad ideas too, so that his craziness could have shape and direction. Bad chemicals and bad ideas were the yin and yang of badness. Yin and yang were Chinese symbols of harmony. They looked like this. The bad ideas were delivered to Dwayne by Kilgore Trout. Trout considered himself not only harmless, but invisible. The world had paid so little attention to him that he supposed he was dead. He hoped he was dead. But he learned from his encounter with Dwayne that he was alive enough to give a fellow human being ideas which would turn him into a monster. Here was the core of the bad ideas which Trout gave to Dwayne. Everybody on Earth was a robot, with one exception, Dwayne Hoover. Of all the creatures in the universe, only Dwayne was thinking and feeling and worrying and planning and so on. Nobody else knew what pain was. Nobody else had any choices to make. Everybody else was a fully automatic machine whose purpose was to stimulate Dwayne. Dwayne was a new type of creature being tested by the creator of the universe. Only Dwayne Hoover had free will. Trout did not expect to be believed. He put the bad ideas into a science fiction novel, and that was where Dwayne found them. The book wasn't addressed to Dwayne alone. Trout had never heard of Dwayne when he wrote it. It was addressed to anybody who happened to open it up. 
It said to simply anybody, in effect, hey, guess what? You're the only creature with free will. How does that make you feel? And so on. But it was a tour de force. It was jus d'esprit. But it was mind poison to Duane. It shook up Trout to realize that even he could bring evil into the world in the form of bad ideas. And after Duane was carted off to a lunatic asylum in, can in a canvas camisole, Trout became a fanatic on the importance of ideas as causes and cures for diseases. But nobody would listen to him. He was a dirty old man in the wilderness crying out among the trees and underbrush, ideas with a lack of them can cause disease. Kilgore Trout became a pioneer in the field of mental health. He advanced his theories disguised as science fiction. He died in 1981, almost 20 years after he made Dwayne Hoover so sick. He was by then recognized as a great artist and scientist. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences caused a monument to be erected over his ashes. Carved in its face was a quotation from his last novel, his 209th novel, which was unfinished when he died. The monument looked like this. Kilgore Trout, 1907 to 1981. We are healthy only to the extent that our ideas are humane. Two, Duane was a widower. He lived alone at night in a dream house in Fairchild Heights, which was the most des desirable residential area in the city. Every house there cost at least $100,000 to build. Every house was on at least four acres of land. Oh my God, can you imagine? Duane's only companion at night was a Labrador retriever named Sparky. Sparky could not wag his tail because of an automobile accident many years ago, so he had no way of telling other dogs how friendly he was. He had to fight all the time. His ears were in tatters. He was lumpy with scars. Duane had a black servant named Lottie Davis. She cleaned his house every day. Then she cooked his supper for him and served it. Then she went home. She was descended from slaves. Lottie Davis and Duane didn't talk much, even though they liked each other a lot. Duane reserved most of his conversation for the dog. He would get down on the floor and roll around with Sparky, and he would say things like, you and me, Spark, and how's my old buddy, and so on. And that routine went on unrevised, even after Duane started to go, to go crazy, so Lottie had nothing unusual to notice. Kilgore Trout owned a parakeet named Bill. Like Duane Hoover, Trout was all alone at night except for his pet. Trout, too, talked to his pet. But while Duane babbled to his Labrador retriever about love, Trout sneered and muttered to his parakeet about the end of the world. Any time now, he would say, and high time, too. <laughs> it was Trout's theory that the atmosphere would become unbreathable soon. Trout supposed that when the atmosphere became poisonous, Bill would kill over, over, at, over a few minutes before Trout did. He would kid Bill about that. How's the old respiration, Bill, he'd say, or seems like you've got a touch of, un of old emphysema, Bill, or we never discussed what kind of funeral you want, Bill, you never even told me what your religion is, and so on. He told Bill that humanity deserved to die horribly since it had behaved so cruelly and wastefully on a planet so sweet. We're all heliogobulous, Bill, he would say. This was the name of a Roman emperor who had a, a sculptor make a hollow life-size iron bull with a door on it. The door could be locked from the outside. The bull's mouth was open. That was the only other opening to the outside. Heliogobulus would have a human being put into the bull through the door, and the door would be locked. Any sounds the human being made in there would come out of the mouth of the bull. Heliogobulus would have guests in for a nice party with plenty of food and wine and beautiful women and pretty boys. And Heliogobulus would have the servant light the kindling. The kindling was under dry firewood, which was under the bull. Trout did another thing which people might have thought eccentric. He called mirrors leaks. It amused him to pretend the mirrors were, were holes between two universes. If he saw a child near a mirror, he might wag his finger at a child warningly and say with great solemnity, don't get too near that leak. You wouldn't want to wind up in the other universe, would you? Sometimes somebody would say in his presence, excuse me, I have to take a leak. This was a way of saying that the speaker intended to drain liquid wastes from his body through a valve in his lower abdomen. And Trout would repeat, would reply waggishly, where I come from, that means you're about to steal a mirror, and so on. By the time of Trout's death, of course, everybody called mirrors leaks. That was how respectable even his jokes had become. 
1972, Trout lived in a basement apartment in Cohoes, New York. He made his living as an installer of aluminum combination storm windows and screens. He had nothing to do with the sales end of the business because he had no charm. Charm was a scheme for making strangers like and trust a person immediately, no matter what the charmer had in mind. Dwayne Hoover had oodles of charm. I can have oodles of charm when I want to. A lot of people have oodles of charm. Trout's employer and co-workers had no idea that he was a writer. No reputable publisher had ever heard of him for that matter, even though he had written 117 novels and 2,000 short stories by the time he met Dwayne. He made carbon copies of nothing he wrote. He mailed off manuscripts without enclosing stamped self-addressed envelopes for their safe return. Sometimes he didn't even include a return address. He got names and addresses of publishers from magazines devoted to the writing business, which he read avidly in the periodical rooms of public libraries. He thus got in touch with a firm called World Classics Library, which published hardcore pornography in Los Angeles, California. They used his stories, which usually didn't even have women in them, to give bulk to books and magazines of salacious pictures. They never told him where or when he might expect to find himself in print. Here's what they paid him. Dooley squat. They didn't even send him complimentary copies of the books and magazines in which he appeared, so he had to search them out in pornography stores. And the titles he gave to his stories were often changed. Pan Galactic Straw Boss, for instance, became Mouth Crazy. Most distracting to Trout, however, were the illustrations his publishers selected, which had nothing to do with his tales. He wrote a novel, for instance, about an earthling named Delmore Skag, a bachelor in a neighborhood where everybody else had enormous families. And Skag was a scientist, and he found a way to re reproduce himself in chicken soup. He would have living cells from the palm of his right hand mix them with the soup, and expose the soup to cosmic rays. The cells turned into babies, which looked exactly like Delmore Skag. Pretty soon, Delmore was having several babies a day and inviting his neighbors to share his pride and happiness. He had mass baptisms of as many as 100 babies at a time. He became famous as a family man, and so on. Skag hoped to force his country into making laws against excessively large families, but the legislatures and the courts declined to meet the problem head-on. They passed stern laws instead against the possession by unmarried persons of chicken soup. And so on. The illustrations for this book were murky photographs of several white women giving blowjobs to the same black man who, for some reason, wore a Mexican sombrero. At the time he met Dwayne Hoover, Trout's most widely distributed book was Plague on Wheels, the publisher didn't change the title, but he obliterated most of it and all of Trout's name with a lurid banner which made this promise. Wide open beavers inside. A wide open beaver was a photograph of a woman not wearing underpants and with her legs far apart so that the mouth of her vagina could be seen. The expression was first used by news photographers who often got to see up women's skirts at, uh, at accidents and sporting events, and from underneath fire escapes, and so on. They needed a code word to yell at other newsmen and friendly policemen and firemen and so on to let them know what could be seen in case they wanted to see it. The word was this, beaver. A beaver was actually a large rodent. It loved water, so it built dams. It looked like this. The sort of beaver which excited news photographers so much looked like this. This was where babies came from. When Dwayne was a boy, when Kilgore Trout was a boy, when I was a boy, and even when we became middle-aged men and older, it was the duty of the police and the courts to keep rep representations of such ordinary ap apertures from being examined and discussed by persons not engaged in the practice of medicine. It was somehow decided that wide-open beavers, which were 10,000 times as common as real beavers, should be the most massively defended secret under law. So there was a madness about wide-open beavers, there was also a madness about a soft, weak metal, an element which had somehow been declared the most desirable of all elements, which was gold. And the madness about wide open beavers was extended to underpants when Dwayne and Trout and I were boys. Girls concealed their underpants at all costs, and boys tried to see their underpants at all costs. Female underpants looked like this. Oh. One of the first things Dwayne learned in school as a little boy, in fact, was a poem. He was supposed to scream in case he saw a girl's underpants by accident in the playground. Other students taught it to him. This was it. I see England, I see France, I see little girl's underpants. 
When Kilgore Trout accepted the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1979, he declared, Some people say there is no such thing as progress. The fact that human beings are now the only animals left on Earth, I confess, seems a confusing sort of victory. Those of you familiar with the, with the nature of my earlier published works will understand why I mournfully expect why I mourned especially when the last beaver died. <laughs> there were two monsters sharing this planet with us when I was a boy, however, and I celebrate their extinction today. They were determined to kill us, or at least to make, us, make our lives meaningless. They came close to success. They were cruel adversaries, which my little friends, the beavers, were not. Lions? No. Tigers? No. Lions and tigers snoozed most of the time. The monsters I will name never snoozed. They inhabited our heads. They were the arbitrary lusts for gold, and God help us for the glimpse of a little girl's underpants. I thank those lusts. I thank those lusts for being so ridiculous, for they taught us that it was possible for a human being to believe anything and to behave passionately in keeping with that belief. Any belief. So now we can build an unselfish society by devoting to unselfishness the frenzy we once devoted to gold and to underpants. He paused, and then he recited with rifle mournfulness the beginning of a poem which he had learned to scream in Bermuda when he was a little boy. The poem was all the more poignant since it mentioned two nations which no longer existed as such. I see England, he said. I see France. Actually... Women's underpants had been drastically devalued by the time of the historic meeting between Dwayne Hoover and Trout. The price of gold was still on the rise. Photographs of women's underpants weren't even worth the paper they were printed on, and even high-quality color motion pictures of wide-open beavers were going begging in the marketplace. There had been a time when a copy of Trout's most popular book to date, Plague on Wheels, had brought as much as $12 because of the illustrations. It was now being offered for a dollar, and the people who paid even that much did so not because of the pictures. They paid for the words. The words in the book, incidentally, were about life on a dying planet named Lingo 3, whose inhabitants resembled American automobiles. They had wheels. They were powered by internal combustion engines. They ate fossil fuels. They weren't manufactured, though. They reproduced. They laid eggs containing baby automobiles, and the babies matured in pools of oil drained from adult crankcases. Lingo 3 was visited by space travelers who learned that the creatures were becoming extinct for this reason. They had destroyed their planet's resources, including its atmosphere. The space travelers weren't able to offer much in the way of, of material assistance. The automobile creatures hoped to borrow some oxygen and to have the visitors carry at least one of their eggs to another planet where it might hatch, where an automobile civilization could begin again. But the smallest egg they had was 48 pounder, and the space travelers themselves were only an inch high, and their spaceship wasn't even as big as an earthling shoebox. They were from Zelta de Mar. The, spokesper the spokesman from, for the Zelta Tamarians was Kago. Kago said that all he could do was to tell others in the universe about how wonderful the automobile creatures had been. Here's what he had said to all the rusting junkers who were out of gas. You will be gone, but not forgotten. The illustration for the story at this point showed two Chinese girls, seemingly identical twins, seated on a couch with their legs wide open. So Kago and, and his brave little Zelta Damarian crew, which was all homosexual, roamed the universe, keeping the memory of the automobile creatures alive. They came at last to the planet Earth. In all innocence, Kago told the Earthlings about the automobiles. Kago did not know that human beings could be as easily felled by a single idea as by cholera or the bubonic plague. There was no immunity to cuckoo ideas on Earth. And here, according to Trout, was the reason human beings could not reject ideas because they were bad. Ideas on Earth were badges of friendship or enmity. En enmity. Their content did not matter. Friends agreed with friends in order to express friendliness. Enemies disagreed with enemies in order to express enmity. The ideas Earthlings held didn't matter for hundreds of thousands of years since they couldn't do much about them anyway. Ideas might as well be badges as anything. They even had a saying about the futility of ideas. If wishes were horses, beggars would ride. And then Earthlings discovered tools. Suddenly agreeing with friends could be a form of suicide or worse. But agreements went on, not for the sake of common sense or decency or self-preservation, but for friendliness. Earthlings went on being friendly when they should have been thinking instead. And even when they put computers to do and even when they built computers to do some thinking for them, they designed them not so much for wisdom as for friendliness. So they were doomed. Homicidal beggars could ride. 
Well, well, Mr. Vonnegut, you are a very funny man. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. So, we will keep going. And I will not be editing out any of the, any of the, the language. So, if you don't like it, I don't know what to tell you. I don't believe in censorship. I will read it just the way Mr. Vonnegut wrote it and the way it is published. Mm -hmm. Words are not the enemies. Ideas are not the enemies. Arrogance and greed are the enemies.